The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, I just want to say a few words of thanks. Um, this whole idea began for me in a conversation with Dan Goods, who's been one of the people whose lives has spanned Art Center and JPL, where he said, why don't you just see if everybody could get together? Um, well, it took a little work, but I think we're well on our way there. And I hope that everyone enjoys learning from the other people in, their, in the room with them now, with whom I think you'll find that there are many lessons. Uh, the process at JPL, for me, simply would not have been possible without the support of many people. So I just wanted to make sure to thank Jeff, uh, Jesse Chris and Garrett Johnston and Diane Mann, who helped make every single day much easier. And I really want to thank Jeff Norris, Dave Nichols, Leslie Levesse, and Tom Forsetti for actually writing the checks. Um, so let's turn to our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is one of the most exciting minds in visualization today. If you have been writing code at all, you've probably used code that he's written. Starting maybe a decade ago with toolkits like Flare, followed not long ago by Protoviz, followed not long thereafter by D3. Uh, by the way, thanks, it wasn't so easy to change. <laughs> but we appreciate it nonetheless. And currently, I think the most powerful toolkit on the web for turning data graphics into living things. Uh, let me introduce a professor from Stanford University and soon to be the University of Washington, Jeff here. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Scott. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And good morning to all of you. Um, in addition to the talk, I'm really looking forward to the conversations that we can have going forward. And what I'd like to do this morning is actually share with you a, a number of insights and projects that we've developed uh, in our research group at Stanford over the last couple of years. Uh, but let's start first with a question, you know, one of these why are we here type questions. So outdated statistic perhaps, but just stop for a moment and ask yourself, how much data, that is total bytes, did we generate and basically collect and store in 2010? And as you think about that, it's not really about the number, it's really coming through what are all the different data sources that we're collecting? So you think, what goes into trying to formulate this number? Certainly, every digital photo taken, every song or audio recording made, every video, every email sent, every financial transaction on the web, probably a good part of your social life. You know, many different things going on into this number. And it turns out one estimate here is for 1,200 exabytes. Or if you like strange uh, you know, units, 1.2 zettabytes, uh, which is a number so large it sort of stymies the imagination. What are we even talking about? Well, to help put this in context, this is over 60 million times the size of the physical holdings of the US Library of Congress. Or if that's hard to imagine, um, take us DVDs and stack them to the moon and back, and you get something near this number. And if for whatever reason you find that unimpressive, well, you know, just wait. Uh, we've got a 10x increase every five years. So the amount of data that we're able to collect is growing dramatically. And so the interesting challenge, of course, is then, well, what do we do with that? And so I've been very motivated by this quote by Hal Varian, Google's chief economist, also a professor at UC Berkeley's iSchool, 
who wrote that the ability to understand, process, extract value, visualize, communicate data is one of the essential skills going into the next decades. Because here we have this essentially free and ubiquitous data, or so he claims, and the complementary scarce factor is our ability to extract value from it. So I really think you know, the lesson or the message for today is to try and figure out how do we go about that process of making this data valuable, really to ha let it have an impact in ways that improves our lives and improves our society. So with that you know, introduction, let's look at some data. This is actually uh, my personal Facebook network, uh, extracted using the Facebook API and then visualized here. So in this case, each circle represents a person, and then these gray lines represent edges or connections in the Facebook service. Uh, the, the nodes, the circles, are actually sized by a statistic called betweenness centrality that roughly gives you a sense of how central that person is within the network. And here we've used an algorithm called force directed layout where we basically treat nodes like charged particles and edges as springs, and then the result is this layout. Uh, again, it gives us a sense of the structure of the network. And indeed, we can learn things from looking at this image. So for example, we see some satellites of clusters. Turns out those are my undergraduate and high school friends. Um, and then you use this big giant blob in the middle. So what's going on there? Well, upon inspection, that's you know, my colleagues from graduate school, uh, colleagues within my research community. So it looks like a big community of practice. And we might stop here and say, OK, great. Now we have a sense of the network. There's these different clusters and maybe some peripheries. That, that's great. Now I have a sense of, of my social landscape. However, sticking with just one representation often falls short. So for example, instead of looking at this as what we call a node link diagram, we can look at this through a different visualization technique. So here we have the exact same data shown as an adjacency matrix, or a matrix diagram. And what we've done here is really put the edges front and center. So here the rows and columns of this table are each representing people, and then we fill in a colored cell when there's an edge between them. And in addition, we do one other thing. We actually have to sort the rows and columns of this matrix in a way that helps reveal structure. So we actually have algorithms of what's called seriation to find the right sorting to help reveal clustering so that highly connected people are placed next to each other in the table. And when we do that, we can actually see some interesting clustering structure. So it turns out, you know, down the bottom right is one of those little satellites we saw earlier. Kind of in the middle top left is one of the others. But then these other big groups were actually previously all collapsed into that one giant blob. And once you have some training and learn to read this diagram, what you learn is that there's actually very interesting substructure going on that's not apparent in the earlier visualization. That actually that big blob breaks down into people in the human computer interaction community, other people associated with UC Berkeley, my alma mater, and others. And so in this way, by changing the representation, we actually get new insights that a previous representation failed to provide. And then here we might actually you know, be content to say we have a qualitative understanding of this network. Maybe now we'll run some additional analyses. Maybe you know, if you're Facebook, you start recommending friends to people. Um, but unfortunately, that too would be an error. Um, so in this case, again, we took this sort of uh, sophisticated approach of sorting all the rows and columns to try and reveal more structure in the matrix. But one of the things that I strongly encourage you to do in any time you're working with data, start by trying to visualize the data in its rawest form a way that you can actually get an understanding into you know, all the little bugs and quirks that may lie within the data set, because trust me, they all have them. So here's what happens if I sort the same matrix just by the order in which the results were returned from Facebook, which in this case is sorted by Facebook ID. And for those of you who don't know, Facebook ID is just basically a counter of who joined the system. So what do we see here? Well, immediately it jumps out at us. We have this bottom right corner is completely missing. So what does that mean? Well, if we were to interpret this literally, it means that all newcomers to the Facebook system don't friend each other. Right, and by your laughter, I'll say you agree with me that this is probably a very unlikely thing. So th this is paused me, you know, caused me uh, a pause to think about this, and I had to dig back into my data analysis process. And what turns out is I tried to be smart, and I tried to get all the data for this visualization in a single query to Facebook system. Well, it turns out there's a 5,000 result limit, and it fails silently. <laughs> so unbeknownst to me, I'm basically missing up to 20% of my data. And using all of the standard representations, that flaw in my data, the fact that I might be making decisions or recommendations on an incomplete view of the world, might have been completely missed. 
So one of the takeaways here is that visualization can be incredibly helpful for understanding data, but it's a tool that also has to be wielded in the correct way. and has to you know, you typically involve a variety of different representations that allows us to triangulate our understanding. And so putting this into a larger picture, of course, visualization is a very important and powerful component, but it's also important to understand it's one piece in a larger process. And that includes how we acquire data, how we assess its quality and clean it, how we might integrate multiple data sets together, and also other issues in terms of how we might go and do algorithmic or statistical modeling, all the way to how we present and disseminate our findings. And it's understanding this process and the role of visualization to you know, facilitate this process that I think is really exciting. Is it might, you know, a naive but convenient fiction might be to assume that we can go through the process something like this, move from one step to another. But as the previous example showed, you know, we typically have a much more wild, wooly, iterative, and interactive process. For example, in the, the matrix diagram we just saw it was one case where we were involved in exploratory visualization, but it actually highlights a data cleaning problem that might then trigger us to go back um, and redo some of our acquisition. So it's understanding these cycles of analysis and these shifts between different representations of data and different models of data that I think is at the heart of making visualization uh, and big data useful more broadly. So uh, let's look at some example projects trying to address some of the issues that arise when we look at the data analysis process in this way. So let's start with issues kind of at the core of visualization. So here's one question that's really motivated uh, some of the work in my group at Stanford, which is how might we better support expressive and effective visualization designs? And I had a long history of writing different software toolkits, but when I came to Stanford, I had the good fortune of working with a really uh, talented student named Mike Bostock, and we decided to uh, reevaluate some of these questions. And we're really inspired by uh, this quote from John Tukey, who wrote this beautiful article in 1962 called The Future of Data Analysis, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend it. It's still very relevant today, probably as much so, if not more so, than it was over 50 years ago. And Tukey wrote that today's first task is not to invent wholly new visualization techniques, though they are needed, but rather we need most vitally to recognize and reorganize the essentials of old techniques to make easy their assembly in new ways and to modify their appearances to fit new opportunities. And in particular, like, what does it mean to recognize and reorganize the essential of old techniques? And as we, as we thought about this, we kind of stumbled upon a very simple, but as it turned out, very effective idea, which is just, you know, how do we think about the construction of an information graphic or a data visualization? Well, at its simplest, you know, graphic is a composition of data representative marks. So here on the left, we have like this famous like, polar bar chart designed by Will Burton uh, to show the effectiveness of antibiotics. This was designed back in the 50s. And we see we can sort of deconstruct this. There's a grammar of graphics here and that we basically have six basic mark types. So the three different bars, each with a different color, uh, two types, lines and circles for grids, and then this background coloring, which is actually telling you something about the, uh, the, the, the different bacteria uh, whose uh, responses to uh, different antibiotics is being visualized. But each one of these we can think of as a statement. So basically a statement about data that is then rendered as a visual form. And so this guy's thinking, like, is this notion enough to provide the basis for a language in which we can express visualizations? And so to do that, we then explored, well, what are the basic graphical marks that build up most of the visualizations we see? Certainly not all, but an interesting and compelling subset. And this is where we arrived. You know, basically, this vocabulary of marks as graphical building blocks. So things like areas, rectangles, plotting symbols, raster images, paths, so like lines and polygons, text, you know, arcs, et cetera. These are these building blocks that we can make statements about how properties of data map to the properties of these marks. We then have a way of expressing a visualization. And so it's this, this sort of insight that we then formalize in the protoviz language, which Scott mentioned, um, and then has most recently taken shape in a web toolkit we call D3, which stands for Data Driven Documents. Which is basically a way of uh, creating interactive web pages by writing statements that map input data properties to visualization properties. So now what I'd like to do is show you some of the visualizations that are possible to create uh, using this kind of simple lexicon of mapping marks. So let's start with a classic visualization. So while visualization's got a lot of attention today, it's actually a long and rich history. Uh, this was a chart originally created centuries ago by William Playfair, who among other things can be credited as the inventor of the pie chart. Um, so despite its ubiquity, it's actually a relatively modern invention, about 200 years. 
In this case, we actually see an, a mashup of multiple data sets. So the weekly wages of a mechanic, the prices of wheat plotted together so you can track their fluctuations. And then to see who's responsible, potentially, you have the reigning English monarch along the top. So this is an early economic dashboard from you know, over two centuries ago. We were able to re-render uh, using our tools. And in particular, what we wanted to do is look at things that were originally drawn by hand, and that we didn't think our language would be suitably expressive if we weren't able to recreate things that were originally done by drafting. Here's another classic example. Uh, this is the coxcomb of Crimean war deaths designed by the nurse Florence Nightingale. And so this is a somewhat exotic time series, that each one of these wedges is a month. And then what you see in black is deaths due to other causes, red due to battlefield injuries, and blue due to preventable disease. So this graph is supposed to starkly illustrate the hygienic problems of the English army. And when asked about this odd design, Florence said that she was designed to affect through the eyes what we failed to convey to the public through their word-proof ears. So she intentionally was trying to make a stark, strange visualization to grab attention. And of course, no visualization framework would be complete without the ability to recreate what Edward Tufte called perhaps the greatest statistical graphic of all time. I'll let you be the judge of that. Uh, Char uh, Menard's uh, depiction of Napoleon's ill-fated march on Moscow. Where here, of course, we see Napoleon's army attack Moscow with dwindling numbers and then decimated in retreat in the cold winter simultaneously plotted uh, you know, with a temperature scale starting at the high point of zero um, for their retreat uh, back to Central Europe. And of course, we can take these ideas now and apply them in more modern contexts. Now, fast forward to the future. All right, so here we have interactive examples. So in this case, what we call focus plus context techniques, where you have an overview of a time series, and we can zoom in on the top above. And this is all running within a web browser here. And here's another technique. This is called a scatter plot matrix. So it's taking the common scatter plot, but we have this for multidimensional data. And so now we want to see all the different dimensions simultaneously. One way to do that is to show all possible scatter plots, so all pairwise projections. And we can couple that with interaction techniques. This is one called brushing and linking, that as I select a subset in one plot, I see how that same data is represented across all the others. So I can, for example, see if clusters in one view are maintained across other views as well. Here's a perhaps more exotic technique. This is parallel coordinates. Here's what we've done is taken seven different dimensions of a data set about automobiles, plotted each dimension on its own axis, and then for a record in the database, we then plot the points and then connect each one with a line. And so while initially a bit of a cacophony, through interactivity, we can actually begin to get interesting multidimensional insights. So for example, here we have the weight of a car. And as I drag out a region, I can see, well, how do, how do heavy cars project across the other dimensions of this data set? We see that they have high horsepower, for example, a good acceleration, so this is a low time uh, from zero to 60, but have poor mileage. And through interaction, we can actually explore different queries or you know, craft different hypotheses to see how different elements in this data set project across the many different dimensions being presented. Of course, we might also be interested in geographic data. This is a map of the uh, airports in the US sized by volume. But then as we mouse around, we can also see the connections from these airports to other airports in the US. And one of the things that you might notice is that as I approach a circle, it gets selected before I even mouse over it. And so finding ways to better support interaction is an important component to visualization. And in this case, we actually have a sort of a sne sneaky visualization behind the scenes, a Voronoi diagram that tessellates the space so that at any point in time, we can always find the nearest point and select that. We also might look at connectivity. In this case, we're visualizing connections between modules within a software project. Each node is a class uh, within a, a visualization toolkit, actually. And these edges indicate dependencies, so which software modules depend on each other. And software modules are, of course, formed into groups. So we have this package structure. And one of the nice things about this representation is that not only can we see individual edges, we can see a more systemic dependencies on how different groups depend on each other. This is achieved by the way in which all these edges or lines are routed. So for example, a naive graph would look like this where I see much less structure. But instead, using what we know about the hierarchy of the software project, we can use that to intelligently route the edges and actually get a, a, you know, a, a macro micro view, as Tufti says, of both global structure as well as individual connections. And finally, we want our languages to support all kinds of different expressive visualizations, including animations and transitions among elements.
And so I'll apologize in advance, this sort of tour de force is a bit gratuitous, but is intended to show that the, all the different varieties of representation you might consider, even for a s relatively simple data set. And I don't necessarily recommend you do this with your own data, but it does give you a sense of some of the richness that's possible uh, with the visualization framework. So, so that's what we did uh, with D3. Uh, those are some of the examples that we can build. Uh, this is an open source project, so if you're interested in creating your own visualization, all of these examples and many more are available online. You can go find it on GitHub. Uh, we should be easy to find. And you've also probably used D3 visualizations even if you might not have known it. So for example, uh, the New York Times has been using it to drive a lot of their uh, data-driven journalism. So for example, this decision tree of different routes for Obama and Romney uh, to the White House uh, was done by D3. Allows you to both see, you know, when the, the kind of the tough odds Romney was facing if you believed Nate Silver's projections. And also allows you to analyze and find cases, for example, the orange dots in the bottom. Those are all the ways the Electoral College could have ended up in a tie. And also, and, um, it's been used in other areas as well. So for example, our friends at Stamen Design, and you'll be hearing from Eric later today, have used this in various locations. Uh, this image actually comes from the European MTV Music Video Awards, where it turns out these visualizations uh, along on the monitors are actually built with D3. And this was very uh, gratifying for us because we were trying to build tools to support scientists and data analysis, and it inadvertently ended up supporting Lady Gaga's Twitter tracker. <laughs> and so. Maybe we'll, we'll hear more from Eric uh, later in the day. Um, so those are some of the issues in visualization. But one of the issues we've run into is also with scale. So we were able to build really interesting and engaging web graphics. But as we did interviews with data analysts, analysts and industry, they said, I'd love to use visualization for my data, but I have massive data warehouses, and all the tools I've tried break or are so slow as to be unusable. And so this led us to ask a different question in our research group. Well, how can we visualize and interact with these billion record databases, the types of data sets that scientists and uh, uh, businesses are collecting in real time? And so this was a project uh, that was done by myself along with uh, my postdoc, uh, Leo Liu, and our intern, B.A. Jung. And we built a system called Immens. And the idea was like, can we find out the right system architecture to support real time interaction with really large data sets? And it turns out to do that, which one of the tricks you have to do is figure out, well, how can I summarize the data set in a meaningful way? It's actually not very helpful to visualize a trillion points. For example, if you have a scatter plot, even with a couple thousand points, it, it's quickly rendered useless due to occlusion, overlapping points, et cetera, let alone sometimes very slow response times. So what are different ways we can summarize the data that are still useful? Well, one example currently used in practice is filtering. So this actually comes uh, directly from uh, a state-of-the-art service, uh, Google Fusion Tables. What we're actually visualizing here is over 4 million user check-ins on a social location sharing site. Um, but what Google Fusion Tables does is it automatically samples the data for you. So rather than show you all 4 million points, it downsamples the data to try and give you a representative view. and actually uses some sophisticated sampling techniques to do so. Unfortunately, we don't often learn much from these types of displays. So for example, sampling in this way tells us, shockingly, that most people live in cities. So what are some alternatives? Well, one is to consider aggregation. So can we chop up the world into lots of little bins and then do counting within that bin to try and give a more complete sense of the data? So again, we're summarizing, but in a way in which we're trying to keep all the patterns persistent if we can. And this graphic has a number of advantages over the previous one. I mean, not least of which is the existence of Canadians and Mexicans. But on top of that, we also see things like you know, the number of check-ins of people on road trips. You actually see the, the interstate highway system come to life. And some of you probably also notice this interesting curve down in the bottom right. So someone actually created a fake account for Hurricane Ike and used that to track its progress over time. So in this way, we want to create visualizations that allow us to see lots of data at a time, but preserve these interesting structures and outliers, you know, the things that don't quite fit the model. Those are sometimes the most interesting bits that we want to preserve. But we also want to be able to interact with it. And unfortunately, computing queries, like you know, basically summing up you know, billions of elements for all these little boxes, can be extremely time consuming and stymie interactivity. So we wanted to be able to support interactions like this, where you might have multiple dimensions. In this case, we have a map, but also time, so hour, day, uh, month uh, variables, and then be able to understand the correlation among them. So for example, how do patterns change during hour of day, um, day of the month, you know, different months within the year, et cetera. And we want to be able to have real-time updates, so basically recomputing these giant queries very quickly. And we want to be able to do that you know, in different ways. For example, dragging out on the map, we then want to see, are there interesting patterns in time? In this case, turns out, not really. 
And turns out a lot of times data visualization is very useful for checking your assumptions. So sometimes those not really interesting things are just as valuable. So what's the challenge here? Well, if we think about the data set here, we actually have what we call a five-dimensional data cube. We have the X and Y spatial coordinates. We also have hour, day, month, et cetera. And if we took all the possible values or all the possible combinations of those variables, we actually end up with a huge space, over 2.3 billion bins. So doing calculations over this, as you might imagine, can be very difficult, especially in a browser, which is the environment that we want to support so that the majority of people can actually look at the data. So what do we do? Well, we took inspiration from systems like Google Maps, which while providing an often seamless sense of space, are actually constructed from a set of individual tiles. So can we can deconstruct the data in a useful way that we can load it in as needed. And so one way we can do that was we can take this giant five-dimensional cube and then project it out. So basically, can we create sub-cubes that, for example, if we want to look just at time, so hour, month, and day, we sum out all of the X and Y variables. And similarly, we can do this for a bunch of other things to get a bunch of smaller data sets. And the reason that we can get away with this is that for the goal of supporting interactivity, for any single pair of 1D or 2D plots, the maximum number of dimensions we need at any one time is actually four. So if you think about it, if I drag over in one scatter plot that uses different variables from a second scatter plot, I need those four dimensions connected in order to be able to compute the projections to do that link selection. But we don't need more than that, so we can actually safely decompose the data in this way. And then further, if we have really large data cubes still, like for example, geography that's spanning the world might be huge, we can then just subdivide it into ranges much like existing map tiles. So the basic idea is if we can just find a way of successfully decomposing the data, and it turns out by doing this, we go from 2.3 billion bins down to a much more manageable 17.6 million bins. Still a lot, but it turns out we can actually fit that uh, if we use the right tricks into less than a megabyte of space. So then what we can do is then we can basically deconstruct the visualization you saw into a series of overlapping what we call data tiles. So for example, one tile might be we have the X and Y for the map top left region and then connected with the month variable. And then we have another tile that then does the same thing but with the day or with the hour. And then we just repeat this process. And with finally the last tile just being for the time variables alone, we've actually stitched together all the data we need to support interactive exploration with 13 of these much smaller data tiles. And this allows us to do this rapid interaction. We still have millions of elements, so it turns out what we can do is actually stick the data on the graphics card and instead use that to compute the queries in real time and do the rendering. And this ends up with this much improved performance. So for example, in a series of benchmarks, we actually took a, a leading state-of-the-art system and found that you know, it only gets about 10 frames per second. So that means as you mouse over, you can get up to 10 updates per second and that's it. But then breaks down after a million elements because of memory issues. Whereas our approach of deconstructing the data actually is uniform. Even as we go up to billion element databases, we were able to maintain 50 frames per second performance. So we're now providing people not just the ability to see these really large data sets, but actually explore the relationships between variables without delay. So those are some of the problems we've been looking at in visualization. And so and to wrap up my talk, I just want to provide examples that come from other parts of this data analysis pipeline. Because I think, again, going forward, I think that's where some of the most interesting issues will arise. And the first is on the topic of data cleaning, uh, which may seem like an unsexy topic, but I imagine many of you have to deal with it incessantly. For example, we went out and interviewed a whole bunch of folks uh, in industry who do data analysis for a living. And this is a representative quote. I spend more than half of my time integrating, cleansing, and transforming data without doing any actual analysis. Most of the time, I'm lucky if I get to do any analysis at all. And we actually have estimates that from 50 to 80% of productive analyst time is spent basically on data formatting and integration issues. So this is a huge issue. And let's even look at a relatively clean data set. This is from the US government looking at housing crime data. This is your tax dollars at work providing a data set which, while human readable, if you load this into any common statistics or visualization package, it will break upon import. And so now you have to write a program to transform this data into the state that your tools like. And this is the type of activity that's eating up some of the, most of the time of some of the most otherwise productive minds of our generation. So I think of this as something of the elephant in the room of data visualization work. This is the thing that people are spending so much of their time on, and yet we talk about the really awesome and amazing visualizations that result, but spend a relatively less time reflecting on the process, and typically the most painful points that were required to get to those interesting outcomes. 
And so we decided to flip this on its head and say, well, can we tackle this as an interesting interaction problem in its own right? And this led to the development of a system called Data Wrangler, which is primarily the work of my PhD student, Sean Candle. So let me show you a demo of how Wrangler works. So we'll start with some data. This is just a simplified version of that same housing crime data we saw earlier, uh, just made here to make the demo uh, palatable. We'll go ahead and load this into our tool, and we've brought it into an environment where here we have a data table, so we can see the current representation of our data. And then on the bottom left here, we have a script that say this is the history of operations that have been performed. So in this case, upon load, we are able to recognize a couple things about the data set. So for example, we can tell that you know, we can split the rows by new line or split into columns based on comma. Of course, I could undo this if I change my mind. But now I'd like to get this data into a, sh a shape where I could load it into a statistics package like R or play with it in a visualization tool like Tableau. But to do so, I really have to change the structure of the data set. So first, let's think about empty rows. We don't need them. So how can I get rid of them? Well, you might notice there's a, a set of operations along the top, and I could just pick the right operations if I'm familiar with the tool, but we think there's a better way. So let's just go ahead and click the row. I can indicate that I'm interested in this piece of the data table, and then the system can search over what are the possible things I could do with that. So here you see the first suggestion is, well, you clicked row two, you could delete that. But we also look at the data, we see that the row's empty, and create a generalized suggestion that to delete all empty rows. So we see that presented as text, and we also see visually what the effect of that transformation will be. This is indeed what I want, so I'll go ahead and hit Enter. The data updates, and this gets added to my history here. Now I'd like to do probably what the most annoying thing about this data is the state names are separate from the actual values. So how can I fix that? Well, I can indicate my interest by going ahead and selecting the text Alabama, trying to tell the system I'm interested in, in pulling that text out. Here the system correctly guesses that I want to do an extraction, and its first guess, it tries to default to simple things, is to pull out the text based on the position within that string. Its next suggestion is to just uh, match directly on that text, which would be great if I was trying to count the occurrences of Alabama, but that's not what I'm doing here. But instead, what I can do is I also see that there are mistakes here in the preview. For example, Alaska's left out because it's too short. But I can just go ahead and start giving more examples of what I want. And then the system can learn from those examples to reduce the number of possibilities. And here we see that it's actually generalized the correct extraction pattern for pulling the state names out. So in this case, it pulls out the word after the text in. So now I hit Enter, and I've pulled the state variable out into its own column. And along the way, you may have noticed all these different um, annotations along the tops of the table. So for example, here we have a number icon showing that the system thinks that this column is primarily numbers. And up above, we see in green all the values that parse correctly as numbers. And then here in red, we can select all of the columns that don't parse as that data type. Similarly, over this column, we see that it's a string type, and we also see that many of the values are missing. That's indicated in gray. So I can click this and get suggestions of things to do with missing values. So in this case, one of the options is to interpolate. So I can fill down and copy the values, which has the desired effect. And I'm almost there, I almost have a usable data set, I just need to get rid of these rows that I no longer need. So I could throw away things that don't parse, or I could throw away things that are missing here, but I'd like a more robust procedure that won't cause any errors in case there are, there are other unexpected anomalies in the data set. So I'll go ahead and select the text reported crime in, because I want to get rid of the rows with that text. I initially get a suggestion of some extractions, but I can give the system a hint, like no, I, I really want to do deletions. So I click that, it updates its inference, and now it gives me the suggestion I want, which is delete the rows that match the predicate that I provided. Great, so now I hit enter, and now I have a clean data set. I could, of course, rename the columns, but I'll spare you that. And the next thing I could do is go ahead and export the data. So now I have the data cleaned, now I'd like to export it for use in another tool. So of course there are a variety of formats, comma separated, uh, JavaScript object notation, all sorts of things. But now imagine my data set was too big to bring into this browser-based tool. What could I do? So for example, what if I just took a subsample of that data and transformed that? Well, in this case, what we have is that we have an entire transformation script. And while here it's written kind of in human-friendly text, these are actually renderings of statements in an underlying programming language of our own construction. So in all those interactive interactions, we're actually programming by demonstration. We can take the resulting program and then compile it to the language of our choice. So now I've taken those interactions and translated them into a Python program that you can run at scale on your own data. And we've done this for other environments as well, such as JavaScript, uh, databases, um, even MapReduce jobs for running on large clusters. 
So in this way, you can interact, visualize your data, find the mistakes, format it the way you want, and then translate that into programs that can then automatically be run at scale on large computing infrastructure. And so this is the, the basic idea with Wrangler, trying to take this tedious job, make it interactive, and also make it scale. And so just to recap, it's really a system with two parts. As I mentioned underneath the hood, we have our own language for data manipulation, including parsing, ways of reshaping tables, also things like lookup tables, like going from a state name to a lat long coordinate, things of that nature. And then that's basically made accessible through this user interface um, that provides what we call mixed initiative interface techniques. That is, as people select elements of interest, we can search over the statements of our language and then visualize them, preview them, uh, to try and help people find the right transformations for their data. Um, and like good researchers, we, of course, evaluate this experimentally. Uh, one of the things we do is actually compare it on a small data set with Excel, which is the most widely used you know, data manipulation tool today. So we first picked a variety of representative data cleaning and transformation tasks, and then measured people's uh, completion time. And here's the resulting distribution. And the major takeaway is twofold. So one is that even with a very small data set, where we're not taking advantage of the Wrangler's ability to scale, we're actually at least twice as fast on median in all conditions. Um, and moreover, we found that the suggestions, we automatically suggest transformations based on user selections and then visually preview them, was the primary mode of interaction, and that people really relied on the visualizations of the operation to determine if the program was doing what they intended it to. So really, we're finding the right visual and interaction techniques to make working with data that much easier. So we believe this points the way to a variety of tools that actually address some of these different issues, from data integration to data modeling as well. And I want to leave you with just one final example that's starting to push into the boundary of statistical analysis and data visualization. We've been much more interested in machine learning techniques and its, their relationship to visualization within the recent years. And one project that got us started in this way was when we were tasked by the president of Stanford to analyze collaboration uh, within the university. So for example, the president might you know, um, requisition millions and millions of dollars to build a new interdisciplinary research center and wants to know if it's having impact. Are the disciplines changing? Are they becoming more similar or more distant over time? And so we sought to answer this question by analyzing the text of all the PhD theses produced at Stanford over the last 20 years. And so given the text of each PhD thesis, we can then group them by the associated departments and then try and get a sense of how the relationship between the departments are changing based on the kinds of words they use in their dissertation. Um, and so one of the things that we did was create this, this visualization um, where here you see the colored circles are departments, and then we put computer science in the center for now, and then the radial distance shows how similar or distant the other departments are. These little dots are actually individual theses, so you can see how computer science theses align with depart other departments to try and look for bridges of interdisciplinary work. Um, one of the interesting things about this project is that we were working with collaborators in natural language processing who have a number of established techniques for trying to understand the similarity between documents. And so we thought we'd have an iterative design process of improving the visualization uh, based on their underlying models. But actually what happened instead was that our visualization uh, converged very quickly to tell us that the models were all wrong. So here, for example, is what it says uh, if you put a history at the center. It says, all of the humanities have no interesting or significant differences. <laughs> now, not only is this wrong on the face of it, this is also for an untenured professor like myself, a very dangerous thing to show in front of uh, <laughs> academic colleagues. So one of the things that was interesting was that the visualization showed us that uh, the underlying models were wrong. In this case, we were using a statistical model called latent Dirichlet allocation, which tries to learn topics. And then was looking at the similarity of these inferred topics to determine um, how similar these different departments are. Turns out the parameter settings, though chosen through an optimization method, were wrong. So we had to change the parameters. And this led us to create other visualizations, and we got domain experts involved. So we actually create visualizations of the output of these machine learning techniques, and then have other professors judge whether or not they agreed with the outcomes. And one of the interesting things is we got lots of disagreement of basically uh, professors finding similarities they thought was false, or finding very distant departments where they thought we were missing a similarity. And in the process of, of really engaging the domain experts and the users of this tool, we had one really interesting insight, which was one false assumption that underlied all the models that we were looking at. And that was the assumption that distances are symmetric. That is, that the distance, say, between genetics and computer science is the same as the distance between computer science and genetics. And it turns out if you ask people, they'll actually give you a contrary result. So here's one example of that. Um, here we can go on. Um, here's computer science in the center. And you know, we might say, well, how is computer science compared to music? 
And it turns out there's no auditory work in the computer science department at, computer, uh, at, at Stanford. Uh, however, the music department has a really amazing computer music program. So you ask people, you know, there's no similarity between computer science and music, but there is a lot of similarity between music and computer science. So we actually used this to go back to the drawing board and build new models that actually learned how departments use words. So we actually first learned a, a word usage model for each department and then asked, given the theses in another department, how much are they borrowing words, so to speak, from the other department? And it turns out that is an asymmetric measure. And so then our resulting final visualization is actually able to capture these effects. Where here, as you put computer science in the center, music is, is out on the periphery. But if you put music in the center, computer science shows up really close. So in this way, by using visualization, it actually became the medium through which we're actually able to elicit the necessary domain expertise to inform our statistical routines. And so these are the types of integrations that I expect to see a lot more of going forward. And that, if nothing else, I hope I've convinced you that there are a number of really interesting research projects that lie at the intersection of these different issues in the data analysis pipeline. So while important as it is to generate effective interactive imagery for data, it's also critical that we understand its role within the larger process of making sense of the data. And so with that, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge all my collaborators and students who did the lion's share of the work uh, I shared with you today. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd also be very happy to take any questions you might have. And if you're interested in any of these projects, uh, most of uh, our, our techniques are available as open source software. You can find them on the web at this URL. Thank you. I just want to let you know, if you want to take, uh, give a question, you can come down to one of the microphones that are in the two aisles here, please. Thanks. I wish I had a prize for the first person to come up. You always need the icebreaker. Thanks for that uh, really nice talk. Um, so one question I have is it seems like one of the things that's great about your tools are all these interactive capabilities. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, how do you take that interactive um, on the fly graphic and turn it into something that you can drop into a publication and so forth? Um, interesting. So how do you drop it into a publication? So in many cases, we actually, we're using the same tools for the graphics in our publication. They just happen to be static. And then we have an interactive version online. Um, I think what your question points to, something I think we would be very excited, is actually rethinking some of the norms in publication. Like I think, you know, when we were right now, we, at our recourse, we either put things online or we stick them in supplementary materials. So basically there's a zip file that's also published with the you know, PDF of our research papers that let people interact. Going forward, I would love to have much more interactive um, examples within our publications. That also requires so thinking the publication format itself, you know, whether or not PDF is the right format for that. If we go to something more open and web-based is one option. But I also think there's an even bigger issue, and you're seeing like, you know, with kind of some very public retractions of, of you know, highly visible research results, publishing not just the paper, but the analysis pipeline itself. And so I think you know, beyond just the visualization, having the, the tool support, being able to package up to make both the data and the analysis procedures rerunnable and inspectable, one would be hugely helpful to peer review, where there's only so much you can actually see in the paper itself, but then also allowing others to build on the work and also really advance science by you know, challenging results that may have flaws. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So it sounds like there is um, a lot for us to learn in how to design graphics. Because I mean, we can try to use your packages, but you know, I can plot x versus y pretty easily. But going in and thinking in detail about how to get all the information that you're getting out of your data compared to what I'm getting out of my data. I don't know, do you have any thoughts on how to start thinking differently about Visual, about this Yeah, process. sure. So there's a lot of interesting topics in visualization that kind of go beyond what I you know, would, would dare try to touch in a single talk. Um, so one, there's a lot to be learned from examples and best practices. There's also a rich perceptual literature on what sorts of things people are able to more effectively decode than others. 
Um, I didn't touch on that in this talk, but if I teach a course at Stanford, I'll be teaching it at University of Washington. So if you just Google for CS448B, you can actually see a whole set of lecture slides on like color design and choosing the right visual encodings um, to help. Now, that said, there's still a very much an art to it. You know, a lot of, just like any good design profession, what do you go through, right? You, know, you learn the rules, you practice the rules, you break the rules, and then invent the rules. And so the thing is, that if you're going to break the rules, it's helpful to know them first so that you know what you're doing. And so um, many different, you know, very creative designs bend or break some of these, you know, like rules of perception in interesting ways. But they provide a nice basis for reasoning through and making, you know, kind of informed rationales as you go through a design process. Uh, one other thing I'll just mention in passing is that there isn't really interesting literature in the visualization community and then trying to take the results of these perceptual studies and then encode them in computer systems that then make suggestions as to appropriate visualizations. However, to date, they're very limited to, okay, I have, you know, I pick three or four dimensions and then I tell you if I should, you know, organize my bar charts or scatter plots or maps this way. And while very useful, there's obviously a much, much broader space of designs uh, that we might consider, um, but that's kind of really, if nothing else, prevents really exciting opportunities for future work in data visualization research. Hi. Uh, the question I had for you was, uh, you shared a lot of uh, effective um, reduction, data reduction to get the elegant uh, visualizations. Uh, that's where you're taking the massive amounts of data and mm -hmm. condensing it to something that you can operate on real time. What's the computational power that you need and what are you relying on uh, in order to do that off? I'm assuming a lot of that is yeah, done yeah, offline. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I should clarify that. What's happening there is you do the data decomposition offline. So you basically you have like maybe a massively parallel uh, database, and then you can compute these data tiles. Similarly, the way Google like pre-renders the entire Earth at multiple levels of representation, and so then they're there to just load in as you need. Um, and then some of the database technology is actually getting to the point that you can compute those on the fly. It's just not at the rate of, of like you know, you know um, uh, exploration. So you could say wait a second or two and maybe start to get results, and then interact with it in real time. I think that's a really feasible model. Um, I'll also note that you know, part of the reason of getting this summary is to get that overview. And I think it's really important that these tools in include the ability that as you drill down into lower and lower detail, you can get access to the source data as well, which is often really, really valuable. It's just trying to understand how do we navigate through multiple scales of the data in an effective way um, that allows us to kind of keep our hypotheses and questions in mind and not have the system break down in ways that then stymie uh, an exploration. But is this a cluster that you have in... You know, in your uh, oh, sure. lab, yeah, or is this, are you using ways. lots of uh, Yeah, I mean, so actually in tools. some cases we can do this on a single node. We just have to wait a long time for the things sure. to compute. But yeah, these are exactly the types of things that, you know, if you look at the data warehouses or, you know, cluster solutions that most, um, you know, industrial contacts are doing, um, they'll have the technology and the, the infrastructure in place to run those queries to compute the outputs that then are available for use in the interactive tools. So yeah, Thank you. that would be a standard workload, sure. Hi. So I, um, I highly empathize with the uh, need for the data cleaning and uh, <laughs> transformation uh, kind of problem you presented here. Um, in, in doing your work with a lot of this um, kind of scripted transformation, uh, I guess I've got kind of two subparts of the question. Um, one is, as you've done a lot of these kind of scripts, what has been your experience in feeding back to the originators of the data about better formatting it? Um, and the second one is, are these scripts uh, invertible such that you could go from kind of this machine readable, nice data format to kind of, in your example, you know, was definitely more intended for a, a human to read with kind of more, more of that layout? Yeah. Um, so the first question is a really interesting one. I don't really have much in a way of experiences to share with you there. We've had the tool online. There's sort of like uh, a limited uh, version of Wrangler as a research prototype online that's had you know, tens of thousands of unique users. And we get all sorts of interesting requests, but none of them have been around. You know, I use this to go tell the data provider to restructure. Mm -hmm. Um, though we hear lots of complaints about the formats that people get, a lot of times they can't be changed. Like there might be systems that are generating log files of a previous format that some programmer decided on 20 years ago and is now considered canonical um, and still creating all these sorts of headaches. Though I do think there's, a, there's an interesting um, challenge in that ideally you would imagine a future in which all the data was kind of output or recorded in a way that it would be structured and you'd avoid some of these problems. 
But you'll never get around it in the sense that, A, there's still other types of data quality issues that lurk, whether it's sensor error, data entry error, these sorts of things. But then in addition, then I take two different data sets that were designed, like the schemas were designed completely independently, and now I want to use them together. Well, I still have to do data transformations to be able to integrate them in many cases. And so we still need some of these operations, even with um, structured data. So mm -hmm. the problem won't go away. Now, regarding your second question with the script, I mean, what we do is we've designed our own domain-specific language. Mm -hmm. And so basically, that's the base. And from the statements in that language, we can do one is map them into these you know, human-readable formats, or we can then take those statements and then map them into a variety of programming languages. We haven't looked at the thing, like, can you take the Python output and then you know, invert it? I think that would be possible the way we structured it, but it hasn't been something that we've needed to do. OK, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when trying to draw a conclusion or make a statement given a big set of data, uh, what sort of best practices do you recommend for essentially which data should you ignore when making your statement or conclusion? Um, I think my, my, my overriding piece of advice is have some questions. Like before you look at the data, formulate questions like things that you'd like to learn, things that you believe to be true about the data, things that you believe to be false, so you actually have kind of assumptions to check. Um, and then you can decide you know, which you know, visual representations or even what statistical techniques might help you assess those questions and assess data quality. Um, I think you know, a lot of times it is specific on the nature of the data. You know, one thing I learned uh, from my colleague Martin Wattenberg when we had an interview was, you know, you know, just like we think of stakeholders of like user and designer when we build interactive system, uh, he taught me you know, data is also a stakeholder. So the other thing is you can never really design an effective visualization process without involving real data. Um, so questions and data is like I think the starting point for all these things, and then and then we could have a high, an offline conversation about some of the more nuanced things that then arise in the process of following down those questions. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for an interesting uh, talk. I'm curious about your plans for Wrangler. Um, yeah. It's one of the first systems I've seen that kind of uses visuals to let you actually perform the kind of analyses that you're, that you're doing on the data itself. And I wonder if you've considered this idea that maybe there could be a visualization that would be output as you were doing that wrangling, you yes. know, so that it's not just about kind of getting the data together yep. Yep. and then OK, now I'm done with that. Now I'm ready. Because like, those lines and those kind of backs and forth yeah. seem like they're going to get ever shorter as time goes right. by. Right. So one of the things that we can do, actually, and have done that I didn't show here, is that as you begin to structure the data, you learn more about it. You can then also start to visualize it. Right. So it's not just these tabular representations, but then providing summary visualizations as part of this exploration and transformation process. Absolutely agree. It's something that would be extremely useful. Um, in terms of what we're doing with it going forward, I didn't want to make a, too much of a pitch, but I've actually co-founded a company called Trifacta based in San Francisco that's starting to commercialize a lot of these ideas around interactive data transformation and visual data quality assessment. Great, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. I think one of the greatest opportunities here is for collaboration between visualization experts and scientists mm -hmm. to look at fundamental questions of science. And so I think for the example that you gave of looking at similarities in uh, dissertations was interesting because you, through the process of interaction, uh, of interacting with the data, learned that the fundamental algorithms themselves were troubled, or at least the ones that they used. Sure. I'm wondering, if you have had similar experience in working with scientists, and in particular, a cultural difference between the kinds of things that you value, the way that you work, the language that you use, and the way that you approach a problem, and if you have, if you could give any stories from those experiences. Sure. Um, so I actually think your opening remarks were spot on in that, you know, in terms of you know, all of these different uh, disciplines or cultures have some really strong analogies in terms of their process of asking hard questions and kind of diving in. However, like, as, as everyone's probably experienced, one of the most the biggest gatekeeping functions of academic disciplines is to invent a whole bunch of conventions and terminology that then become yeah. sort of siloed discussions. And so I felt that when working, whether it was with social scientists or with biologists who are primarily I've worked with, it's just you need to spend the time working together side by side. Um, so oftentimes this is best done with a student or teams of students who actually can reside in both worlds. And then, then sort of then um, educates us grown-ups 
you know, <laughs> as, as, as we go through. Um, and so just one example that's really funny. Some of these times these things have big consequences. And this is actually a secondhand story uh, from colleagues of mine who are building tools for um, biologists, particularly studying like protein um, interaction networks. And they built like a graph visualization system, and it was, you know, and it had like different types of proteins based on where they tend to reside in the cell and how they were interacting. And they were really proud of this tool. And they go and they show it to the biologists, and they're like, "This is horrible." And they're like, "What? Why? What's wrong?" It's like those aren't circles; those are always squares. Those are always squares. We never use circles for that. And they just couldn't read it. It was almost like it was like set in a language that they <laughs> were unwilling to, to read. And so he's like, "Okay." So he goes back, changes one line of code, and comes back with the right shape. And then they love it. <laughs> um, and so I mean, exaggerate a little bit, but it's one of these interesting things, just understanding the conventions, the norms, and the vocabulary, I think, is the initial jump. The mm -hmm. other thing that's, I think, most important from my perspective as someone working in visualization is that I need to learn enough, certainly as much as I possibly can, about the science and understand the nature of the question. Like, this happens in any user-centered design type process where it's not what the user wants, it's what they need. And their ability of people to always to articulate what they want is you know, imperfect at best. And so you have to have that empathy and that understanding of the, the scientific goals, what constitutes a breakthrough, what are the types of explorations that you have to do, so then you can, can translate that into what the visualization and what the interaction techniques should provide. Mm. So. Thanks very much. Yeah. I don't know how we're doing on time. I don't want to yeah. bleed into people's break. Nice presentation. Um, I had a question on... on some of them, because you, you showed a lot of 2D type images, sure. and, and I deal with time values a lot. Yeah. So I like to present items in 3D. So, for example, in your in your Facebook example, uh, could you make that in 3D where you can rotate it, showing how long a person hasn't talked to you in a while, so you can actually show time in that way. Okay. So, so it, yeah. So it's an interesting question. So one thing I, I'll I'll be upfront. There are a couple hot button controversial issues in information visualization. And the use of 3D is like top among those. I, I think uh, alongside those are you know, bar, bar charts versus pie charts, which believe it or not has a huge controversy. Right. Um, and the use of rainbow color scales, which right. really just needs to end. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I can tell you more later why. Uh, same, unfortunately, with 3D is that in, in the case of when you're dealing with uh, inherently 3D phenomena in the physical world, oftentimes it's very useful to have that in your representation. However, almost all research I know to date has found that when you have abstraction, in the sense that you're choosing the visual mapping, it's not, say, like a spatial mapping that you're trying to preserve, that you know, in all examples I've seen where people have done a design study, the 2D variant has been more effective than the 3D. Some of the reasons for that is you, know, you don't have issues with occlusion. You can tend to see things more directly. So you, you spend time looking. Your eyes are faster than your hands. Right? So if you're using interactivity where you could be using vision, you're, you're kind of in a losing game. And it turns out our depth perception for many people isn't that good. Um, but I'm also open to the possibility, because I haven't seen studies that have looked at this, that people who deal with 3D, you know, flat 3D representations at a much, maybe they grew up with video games, maybe they do this as part of their analysis daily, may have you know, better spatial abilities uh, and make better use of those displays than others. But one paper that I would recommend, it was at the InfoViz conference, I think in 2011, it was a team from Harvard, compared a standard visualization for arterial decay so it used a 3D model of arteries and coloring. And then they, they, they very cleverly crafted a 2D variant where basically they butterfly open the arteries and then show the hierarchy of the arteries in a flat display. And this is actually both exciting and scary in that you got trained medical professionals to use both the standard 3D representation and the 2D representation. And their accuracy went up significantly, both statistically and practically, with the 2D variant, which that means like down the line, someone's life probably could have been saved if that 3D chart hadn't been used. Okay. Thanks. So that's, that's kind of the state of the art. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just yeah. building off of Scott's question about different cultures between um, science and um, des in, uh, design, I find that in um, science, it seems like there, there's all these conventions and norms. And if you look at publications in a certain field, there's really a fairly limited number of ways, different types of figures that you'll see in those publications. And as I'm learning more about data visualization, I'm realizing, wow, you can really get a lot of new insight and communicate a lot better by finding fundamentally different ways to visualize your data. And that's really exciting. But I, just based on the sort of culture of how scientists like to present information and, um, and communicate, I, 
expect that there would be a fair amount of resistance to, you know, instead of doing this one type of figure that always is used in this type of, you know, publication in this field, to doing something radically yeah. different and showing it in a very different way. Do you see that that barrier is there and do you foresee it breaking down? And if so, what kind of steps yeah. to, to go in that direction? Yeah, so, so fortunately in my own field, we're encouraged <laughs> to do these things. However, I remember actually, for example, I was collaborating with uh, Professor Deborah Gordon who studies ant colonies at Stanford. And we actually have a paper in a, a journal of animal ecology. And that was interesting because yeah, we did get some pushback on some of the more interesting, I thought were rather tame, you know, visualizations <laughs> that we put in. I think one of the things that's extremely important, whether or not it, it um, keeps the editors happy, you know, is another issue. But certainly I think the onus is on us to properly explain the visualization, certainly it has to have the, the corresponding text, captions, or guides, et cetera, really have to aid the interpretation of that graphic if people are unfamiliar with it. Um, and so I think part of that is just making sure that the, you know, while the, the, there's value in the visualization, there's sometimes learning associated with it, and you want to support that learning and be, be attuned to that. Um, there are also some larger sort of sociological or even political <laughs> issues in terms of like the rate at which different fields are willing to accept things, and so in that sense, you know, you just have to keep pushing, and sometimes it's like you find the venues that are acceptive of that work, and then and things work their way through. Turns out the same thing is true with statistical methods. Like if you use a brand new statistical method in a social science journal that's used to like a standard regression formulas, you know, you can get pushback on that, and again, it's because people want to vet the research, and if they're having difficulty understanding it or vetting its validity, that's a problem, and so I think we really do want to bridge that gap and, and explain, uh, you know, both what the visualization should shows and perhaps outside of the, you know, maybe in blog posts or other means, showing alternatives and, and trying to give an argument for why one representation might be preferable to others. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>